Great. Thank you. Um, I hope everybody can hear me. Um, if you if you want to make comments, if you type type comments in the in the chat, then um, you know we we can see them and then we can we can um, jump in and uh, respond to them as we go along, or we'll do, do them at the end, as you say. Um, otherwise, um, we'll just kick straight off. I think. Um, all right. Good morning, everybody. Um, nice to nice to not see you. Um, <laughs> you can see one person there, um, but um, everybody else has got their um, screens off. That's fine. It's, I find this very very strange. It's, it's been a while since I've done Zoom. I must admit, I was doing a lot of it during lockdown. We tried to tried to teach art and design um, at uh, the University of Creative Arts in Farnham. Um, we tried to teach it remotely during Zoom because it was all we could do, and it was extremely difficult to say the least. So um, I'm a bit sort of scarred by that, but um, we should we should be okay. So um, basically, in just a moment, I'll I'll share my screen, and I've got a, um, a kind of slideshow to show you of, of images, so you don't have to look at me all the time. Um, my name is Peter Wren. Um, I'm a photographer. Is what I usually describe myself as. Um, um, I'm an artist um i work with with photography um photographer is just a good enough term to be um, to be honest um as i already mentioned I, I teach i experiment um i work for other, other photographers i print i have a um, traditional dark room i still print um traditional film um, photographs on on a weekly basis uh, for my own work and other people um, but i'm also very interested in um in early photography experimental work but also early processes i love the 19th century um um, before, but when I say what, before photography lost its innocence in some ways, it's um, it's, it's there's something very interesting about well the, the earliest processes, the way that they affect the way that you make work if you're if you're doing them that way. Um, I work with original equipment. Um, this is not a prop. This is this is something that I actually use. It just it kind of lives in this room. Um, working with with large plate cameras, um, all sorts of things like that. So. Um, I, obviously I teach workshops in it. Um, one of the things that I'm particularly keen on is the wet collodion process. I've been doing it for about 10 years now um, alongside other things. So um, we're going to look at um, that process, where it fits in photographic history, um, how the process is actually done. I'm going to cover the methods of, of how we actually go through step by step um, and then show you some of the, just briefly a handful of the photographers who were using it at the same time as John Thompson. Um, and then um, a few of the photographers are using it today because it's uh, it still lives on. So if I just share my screen now, um, I'm sure somebody will shout if they can't uh, see that. Uh, hopefully you can see that. Right. Hopefully that's all okay. Shout at me if you if that's way frantically if that doesn't work. But is that good? Is that good? Yeah. Excellent. Thumbs up. Thank you very much. <laughs> OK, um, so um, starting off with um, to set the scene with photography um, in the 19th century, uh, photography has quite a murky um, and complicated past. Um, and early history is, is quite complicated, um, but generally we take the, the birth date of photography to be um, January 1839. People had done experiments before that, but um, this is basically um, the point where it's acknowledged that the first viable, truly viable processes that other people could repeat and, and use to make pictures, which still exist, um, is, a, is January 1839. These two gentlemen here, the chap on the left is a um, Frenchman called Louis Daguerre, um, inventor of the daguerreotype, also a co-inventor of the daguerreotype, it would be strictly accurate, and uh, William Henry Fox Talbot, who is the, um, in the, the British... Um, Scientist, gentle, gentleman, amateur, um, um, polymath, interested in all sorts of things. Both of them came up with processes. Um, they've both been working on processes um, in the 1830s. And Daguerre published, technically published first, um, and then told that I had to rush into into print and kind of say, yes, I've, I've invented something as well, and actually I've been working on it for a while. So it doesn't really matter who who was first. They both had very different processes. Um, they, they both worked with um, you know the, the silver salt, silver compounds, but they, the approach to it is very different indeed. Um, the picture on the left, this is a daguerreotype. This is Daguerre's process. Um, it's made with a, um, you start with a, a sheet of copper, um, like a printing plate, which is polished and polished and polished until it's absolutely mirror smooth and perfect. Um, it's then silver plated, and then it's polished some more until it's absolutely smooth as, as it can possibly be. Um, it's then 
made light sensitive by exposing it to um, various um, chemicals such as um, bromine and iodine sensitized in a sensitizing box, fumes of bromine, which are particularly not particularly nice, um, exposed in a camera and then developed by exposing it to the fumes of mercury. So you boil some mercury in a little pot above the, uh, the image and it causes the image to, to come out. So not the safest process in the world. Um, that's why it's one of the things that's quite difficult to do these days. I have made them, they are wonderful. Um, but it is extremely time consuming. They are breathtakingly beautiful. The um, the quality of them is superb. The um, the sharpness, the um, the detail is absolutely wonderful, but they're very difficult to do. Um, and also because it's a one-off direct positive, what was in the camera becomes your picture. You can only make, you know, you have one copy. If you want a second copy, you've got to take another photograph. So that was a disadvantage. Um, Talbot's process, um, which is um, usually called the, the color type, sometimes called the Talbot type, um, was made using much simpler process, was made using paper. So a piece of paper soaked in, in um, salt solution and then um, coated in silver nitrate, made it light sensitive. Um, that went into the camera, was exposed. That then became a negative and it had to be printed again onto another sheet of paper to reverse it out to make a positive. Um, Big advantage in that, of course, if you have a negative and then you make positives from it, you can make prints, you can make multiple copies of something. Um, so in that way, it's it's a, had a big advantage over the daguerreotype. The downside was that because it was on paper, the paper fibers kind of um, detracted from the image. So this is, you know, this is a good, good type, calotype image on the screen, but it's not as sharp as they were never as crisp and as, as pristine as um, the daguerreotypes. But they were considerably easier to make and you could make several images um in as many copies as you liked uh, you could also work to a bigger size because all you did was make a bigger plate um use a bigger sheet of paper um the problem with it with a daguerreotype is you start polishing a bigger and bigger plate it gets very very time consuming you can take all day to, to polish one plate so the answer everybody was looking for um was to find a way of making the best parts of both processes and people fairly quickly realized that the ideal thing would be to do if you could have a daguerreotype kind of silver image but on glass rather than paper that would be the, the solution because the glass wouldn't have any fibers wouldn't have any texture to it you could make a negative you could make lots of copies of all the advantages of Talbot's process but without the, the fibers getting in the way they tried all sorts of things there's people there are experiments um, people tried albumin egg white and that kind of worked, but it was very, very slow. Um, some people tried um, milk, even that. Again, that kind of works, but it's it's not very successful. There's even recording of people using the slime from snails, which is a particularly strange process. Um, I don't know anybody who's ever tried to reproduce that one. Um, I think getting enough snails might be a difficulty, but um, it's uh, it's a way of making the the silver nitrate, which is the, the important bit, this, the um, the light sensitive bit, stick to the glass. That was a difficult point. Uh, the person who solved it um, is on the screen now, Frederick Scott Archer. He's the kind of hero of Collodion, the founder of the inventor of the Collodion photographic process. He was a sculptor. Um, he was a um, sculptor and photographer. He was looking for a way of making making better photographs to um, cover his own work, to, to photograph his own work. So um, he knew a bit of chemistry and he came up with this substance called collodion, which he didn't invent. It had been invented relatively recently. Um, it's nitrocellulose, which is sometimes called gun cotton. So it's an explosive, um, which is dissolved in ether, which is super highly flammable and will also knock you out if you if you um, breathe in too much of it. Um, so nice, nice cocktail of, of dangerous chemicals there, but it was used for orig originally for um, dressing wounds. So you could it um, it pours as a liquid. Um, it's like a um, kind of sticky, um, sticky very um, sticky varnish. As it dries, which it does very very quickly, um, it becomes it solidifies into a very very thin film, a bit like um, very thin cling film or um, cellophane, um, which is impervious to the air. So it's ideal for dressing wounds in battlefields and that sort of thing. Um, it's, it's still used medically, in fact, but um, it doesn't actually used to be. He discovered that if you coated this onto a sheet of glass, while it was still wet, um, before it had a chance to dry out fully, you could um, dunk it into a solution of silver nitrate. That would make it a light sensitive emulsion in photographic terms on a glass plate, and you'd be off and running. You could make a, 
make an image. It had a number of, of advantages. Um, sorry, I've gone too far forward there. Um, by accident. Being on glass meant that it was um, you, you had you had a negative that you could you could print multiple copies from. It didn't have the texture problems that the, the paper negatives had. It was a lot cheaper to do than um, daguerreotypes. You can imagine silver plating and polishing copper, copper plates um, is going to be quite an expensive and time consuming process. Um, but the biggest, probably the biggest advantage in photographic terms, it was, was that it was a lot more sensitive. So whereas a, if you wanted to make an exposure with a daguerreotype or a um, calotype, you'd be looking at a few minutes minimum kind of exposure, may, maybe um, 10 minutes if you were lucky. Um, he got that exposure time down to a few seconds. It was much, much more sensitive um, to the light. So you could um, you could make, um, make images. Portraits became a lot more easy um, to do. You didn't have to sit there for great long lengths of time. Um, Make a lot of things a lot easier. Um, so I will, I will talk a bit more about the advantages and how that revolutionised things at first. But um, I'm aware that I'm glossing over the um, the process quite a lot here. So um, I'll I'll now take you through the process, if you like, um, step by step, um, at least most of the the significant steps. Um, so I've got some pictures here. The um, the images on the left are um, from contemporary manuals on how to do the process. There's some rather lovely engravings that. Uh, are nice and clear and very very kind of 19th century but I've also to kind of show you how we we do it nowadays because we still work in exactly the same way I've got some images from workshops that I've taught um sort of side by side so um, so the first stage of the process here is you take your glass plates which are the cut to the right size to fit whatever camera you're using they can be anywhere from um tiny little things the size of a postage stamp up to great big sheets of glass like window panes depending on how big an image you want to make um, how, big, how big a camera you're prepared to lug around. Um, and the first thing you do with your glass is you clean it and you clean it and clean it and polish it so that it's got no dust and dirt on it and no, very importantly, no grease. Um, so this, this is what Emily's doing here um, in a Farnham UCA workshop, um, polishing the plate, getting all the, all the grease and grime off it so that the um, collodion doesn't stick. If you don't do that, sorry, it doesn't stick. If you don't do that, it it will peel off the surface, usually right at the end of the process when your masterpiece is, is drying and it looks wonderful. As it dries, it all crinkles up and turns into a little ball of cling film on the floor and nobody, <laughs> nobody enjoys that particularly. So the cleanliness is the most important part of the process. Um, once it, the, the plate is lovely and clean, um, you pour the collodion. Um, now the collodion, you can see the consistency of it there. It's, it's like um, a bit like maple syrup in consistency. Um, you pour a puddle of it onto the glass and then tip the glass one way and the other to get a nice even coating on it. If you're good at making pancakes, you, quite often you're good at making um, collodion plates. Um, it's the tilting and tipping of it. Um, people get extraordinarily nervous when they do this in workshops and say, it doesn't matter if you make a mess of it, um, we'll just make another one. But um, it does require a steady hand and it does take a bit of, bit of practice and a bit of skill to get it right. Um, so you pour the collodion onto the surface as soon as you start pouring the collodion, the clock is ticking. If you don't get everything done, that's why it's called the wet collodion process. If the collodion is allowed to dry out completely, you've had it. It won't work. It's no longer effectively light sensitive. It's um, it has so the whole process has to be done before the collodion dries out fully. So you've got to be, usually got about in hot weather maybe ten minutes. Cold colder weather, um, humid weather, you've got a bit longer. Um, so you have to have everything ready, and you have to have your darkroom and all your processing facilities handy um, next to where you're making photographs. And um, we'll see why that's significant in things as we go along. So once it's poured over the surface, um, the plate then gets loaded into a tank full of silver nitrate, which is the sensitizing agent. And this is the point where it becomes light sensitive. So the tanks have lids on them, which are light proof. It goes into the tank and it just sits there stewing in the tank um on its own for about about three minutes or so is generally the accepted time and that allows us the silver nitrate to soak into the collodion which has got various other iodides and, and other chemicals in um involved in it as well to make a silver halide solution which is akin to the black and white film that many of us have used for for many many years and still just about hangs on in existence so you're making your own emulsion and it's sticking to the glass so um that takes about three minutes from there, it's um, the next part of the process is, is done in the dark room. Um, when you take it out of the silver nitrate tank, you've got to be in the dark, or at least under red safe lighting, same as um, photographic paper if you've worked in a dark room. 
um, from there, it goes into a special plate holder, which um, gets loaded into the back of the camera. When it's in the back of the camera, um, you can take your photograph. So here you can see that happening again in the workshop and uh, nice, nice engraving. I've got this engraving later on as a slide as well. So um, working with a plate camera, this is my, my 12 by 15 Chapman camera. So it will work to, it will make plates that are almost, almost A3 size, just about A3 size um, and any size smaller than that as well. So while it's still wet, you shoot the picture. Um, I don't know whether you can see, can you see the um, the person on the, the right-hand side of the screen or is it's covered up on my my screen? Um, can I move that across? Is that, um, I'm just getting the, uh, I'm not sure whether that's similar. Anyway, the, if you can't see it, the um, the, um, the girl on the, the right um, has got a, a head brace behind her head. Just, it's not a, not a clamp, it's not a physical thing, but it's just a little support to hold her head still because the exposure time, you know, you can see it's a nice day in this picture. I think the exposure times that day were probably something on the order of, of 10 to 20 seconds. Um, so you have to sit quite still and just having a little thing. It's a bit like, I said, it's a bit like a car headrest. It just gives you something to keep an eye on, to keep um, keep uh, keep your head still. So that's that's the exposure done. As soon as the exposure is done, it's back into the darkroom and the, pro the print is developed. So you pour, a small amount of developer, only a, um, kind of a, like an egg cup full over a plate, depending on how the size of the plate. Um, you pour it over the surface and just let it pool on the surface. And it develops very, very quickly. About 15 seconds is the norm. You see the image appear as a negative um, in front of you on the, on the plate. Um, as soon as the, the image looks right, you do what's called development by inspection. As soon as it looks good, as soon as it looks good, it's got healthy highlights and midtones and shadows you rinse it and you rinse it with lots and lots of distilled water and flush all the developer off it. And then this is the bit that freaks out anybody who's been in a traditional darkroom. Um, you can then turn the lights on before you fixed it, which people who've been in a traditional darkroom go, ah, you can't do that. Um, yes, you can. Um, it works, it's fine. And we, we do this part of the process in the white light because everybody, it's, it's the magic part, everybody enjoys it. Um, you, you lower it into fixer and it's traditional fixer, the same as we still use for the black and white darkroom. It's, um, Sodium thiosulfate is absolutely fine. Um, it makes, and it dissolves, what Fixer does, it dissolves away the silver parts of the image that you don't want that are going to be the shadows. And if your negative is in a, in a tray with a black background, it looks like a positive because it's now lighter than the black background. So you get an image which appears to change from negative to positive and all the milkiness, all the clouds kind of part and your image appears. And whenever I do a workshop, with any any number of people with this kind of thing. The first thing everybody does when they see this, everybody swears. And then the second time, everybody gets their phones out and films it because everybody I can't believe what I just saw. Um, it's it's fantastic. It's really, really pleasing. And it happens very, very quickly. It happens in about 10, 15 seconds. So it's very, very rapid. From that stage, there's a negative that's finished. Um, it just needs to be um, washed and then dried. Once it's been dried, it can be printed. And the traditional way of printing them is by contact printing. Um, they're just placed in a, in a frame like this with a pressure pad on the back uh, with a piece of paper behind it that's been sensitized to um, with silver nitrate, very much like Talbot's process, um, but with a, a glass negative over the top of it. And you make a, a print just with the daylight. Um, and that's that's basically how you go through the basic process. Um, very quickly, people discovered um, that there were other other methods, other variations you could do in the process. So oh, there's the negative on the left. Um, that's, I think, ma mainly what Thompson used. He worked with the, the negatives. But people discover this thing about looking at it in the tray that it looks like a positive. If you take your glass negative and you back it with black paper or um, sometimes velvet or even paint um, and you increase your um, activity or develop, developer a bit and underexpose a bit, you can get a direct positive onto glass. Um, sometimes called daguerreotypes on glass. They're not daguerreotypes, but that's a kind of sales pitch. Um, that's what's called an ambrotype. And I, I've got quite a few of those in my own collection. Um, and they, they are one-offs, but they are, and they're, again, what I teach quite a lot is because people can make things that they can take home. Um, or you could um, print it onto black and metal. You could, you could use a, a metal plate, which is what the image on the right is, um, sometimes called a tin type. They weren't actually ever made of tin. They were always made of... Um, usually pieces of steel um, that's been blackened with some sort of sometimes bitumen or black paint um, and the, the image directly onto them. And again, they were very quick and very cheap to make and they were very durable 
um, they survive this one on the right um, I picked out of an antique shop um, somebody's rummage bin and it was in there with um, old, sort of old knives and forks and door handles and all sorts of bits of metal because it was a bit of metal so he chucked it in there as well and it's, but it survived being bashed around in amongst all this it's a beautiful fragile little thing but um, Peter, we've um, we've got a question that's come yes. up in the chat. Um, so it's from Jane. It says, "Is the silver nitrate process similar to the backing of old mirrors?" Yes, yes, there is a, there is a connection. Um, the backing of old mirrors it makes it metallic silver, which is obviously silver coloured. Silver silver nitrate, when we use it in this process, is usually black. But there is there is a link. Yeah, silver nitrate is used in in both processes. I think. Yeah. So all of this may sound like a quite a complicated process um, to us now, but it's um, it was so much easier than the daguerreotypal processes have gone before. Um, it's um, it meant meant that um, because Archer had, uh, had published the um, his his findings how he had to do the process in the Chemist magazine, um, free, gratis, and and with no um, no kind of copyright on it whatsoever. Unlike Talbot and Daguerre, who both wanted licenses um, to use their processes, um, which meant, meant things were quite difficult um, for photographers. This was what we'd now call open source. Um, anybody could do it. He, um, Archer, unfortunately, never made a penny from it, which is um, a terrible shame, to be honest. But uh, it meant that photography really expanded. Um, this is 1851 we're talking about when Archer first published. And immediately it started killing off the daguerreotype and the type. Um, pretty much instantly because this was cheap you didn't have to pay for a license and it was a lot easier to do um, this is um, the image on the screen and on the left um, what are called gem tintypes um, usually made with a camera with nine or more lenses and um, lots of little tiny weeny sort of a bit like um, the, the uh, photo booth pictures that you still get nowadays um, little tiny images like that um, this is the label from the back of it. You say you can get three dozen of them for two shillings and sixpence um, or nine for a shilling. So, you know, no money at all. Um, very, very affordable. Um, and lots and lots of people had their photographs um, made. The amber type on the right um, is one of my, it's probably the prize of my collection because it's, um, that's my great grandfather um, with um, one of his cousins. So uh, you know, know, knowing I'm related to him is, is rather fantastic. Um, and it's, it's you can see the crack across the middle. It's on glass and it has has been damaged. But an awful lot of people started making photographs. It was a boom time for um, kind of photographic industry. All sorts of people started being adding photography to their businesses. So you get photography por portrait studios in coffee shops or barber shops or um, chemists or all sorts of people would sort of add it to their kind of repertoire to do. Um, and one professional photographer at the time wrote. Um, Photography is a marvellous discovery, a science that has attracted the greatest intellects, an art that excites the most astute minds, and one that can be practised by any imbecile. Um, which is, I think, a good summary of it. Um, the chap who, who said that um, was this, this gentleman, um, Gaspard Félix Tournachon, um, French, as you might guess, um, who started as a political cartoonist. He went by the, the trade name of Nadar, that was his, his sort of nickname his friends gave him and he adopted this as his uh, his kind of um, stage name if you like um he saw this explosion of photography in the um, early 1850s um and the popularity of it and his banker said you're a cartoonist um sorry it's a bit falling off my light in the background um you're a cartoonist this is the future this is going to take over from photographing lots of people that's that's um nadar in the middle at the um the multi-image there that's you can see what, what he actually looked like um he he set up a photography studio at first he got his brother adrian to run it but adrian wasn't a very good um businessman and, and lost quite a lot of money and it was only when um, gaspar himself took it over um that it started to make make money because um, it turned out he was he was a much better businessman. He's also it turned out a very good photographer. He's he's now regarded as one of the greatest um, early photographers because his photographic style is is second to none. Um, you know, he made very simple, very very modernist portraits long before for his time, um, and he was hugely successful. Um, you know, he's he uh, he had a huge he turned the business into a huge. Um, 
huge undertaking in in Paris and making lots and lots of pictures. Um, everybody came to to be photographed by him. And because printing of the images was so cheap, it's very simple, very easy to do. You could make um, make multiple copies quickly, um, just on on albumin paper, which is paper soaked in egg white and then um, with silver with salt and then silver nitrate added to it. You can make lots of prints, stick them to um, a, a piece of card, print your your um, your name on it, or your in the case of the one on the right, which is a Nadar, his um, his logo. He was uh, very good at marketing right from the, the start. Um, and then people would order multiple copies for their families and their friends, and they became used as visiting cards. Um, the French term carte de visite, which is what these are usually known as, obviously means visiting card. Um, there was a huge craze for them. Everybody, um, it seems, in all over the world was um, was was making these and and, uh, and swapping them and uh, and and collecting them. You could collect them of famous people. Um, you could buy pictures of the royal family and uh, celebrities, actors and actresses and, and all of that sort of thing, as well as having ones of your family. So um, there were huge numbers of them around. Um, the other thing that was very popular was stereo views. Um, if you took a camera that had two lenses um, and shot two pictures side by side, this is actually a John Thompson um, image um, that he's made because he, you know, he, he was working commercially you know, and they, and stereo views were good sellers, particularly of, um, fancy foreign places that uh, you know, people wouldn't have themselves have a chance to visit. A stereo view, if you've if you've used one, they're fantastic things. They um, you look at an image made with a stereo viewer, you feel like you're in the picture, and when it's somewhere foreign and exotic, there's so much more special, so much more exciting. Um, so these pairs of images, again, I, I have quite a few of these in my own collection. So. All of this meant that a photographic industry started actually to to come um, to come to pass, if you like. Um, these ladies on the left are are all printing pictures. You can see it being done on an industrial scale. There they are in a in a what would be called a glass house. They're using daylight as the light source to print their print the pictures. They they've got the boxes of paper and the holders all all wrapped up, and they're placing them in the sunlight to expose them, and working away all day long. Um, you can see there's some fantastic, I love the backs of these cards very often, the image in the middle, you can see um, you know, artistic photographers, um, people selling their wares. Portable photographic um, caravans, if you like, this kind of photographic van on the right, um, very, very typical with the pictures of your sample pictures on the outside so that you can have your picture taken. People would travel around as itinerant photographers and there are people who still do that as we'll see later on. Um, all of this kind of exploded in the 1850s and the 1860s, very, very popular because, um, you know, it was easy and cheap and everybody um, with, an, with a bit of business acumen that could set up as a photographer. And um, some, some terrible work made, but also some fantastic work done. Um, all of this meant that, you know, you could buy things off the shelf for the first time instead of having to go to the, you know, the, like the early photographers, you had to go to an op optical instrument maker and have a camera built. Um, or adapt something yourself and, and make something. You start getting cameras advertised in catalogues in different sizes and shapes. And the notion of amateur photography as a pastime as something that you might want to do as amusement started to, um, to turn up. Um, and a great example of this is um, Julia Margaret Cameron, who I'm sure almost everybody has probably heard of. Um, she's, a, she's a great example of exactly this kind of explosion of, in photography. Um, in 1864, um, she was um, a big family, typical Victorian family. She's a mother of six children. Um, they'd all left home or they were away at boarding school. Um, her husband was off um, on business abroad and she was knocking around in the house on the Isle of Wight on her own. And her daughter, one of her daughters, um, gave her a camera and developing equipment um, and the, the letter, I think, still exists. It says, it may amuse you, mother, to try to photograph during your solitude at Freshwater. Um, so here's here's something you might you might find that's fun, mum, you know, while you're on your own, have a go at this. Um, and oh boy, did she have a go at it. She was she was a fantastic um, photographer. She she took to it with huge amount of enthusiasm. Um, she was, you know, she had the leisure time. She was well off enough to, to be able to indulge it uh, herself as a hobby. Um, but she had a huge amount of energy and a very, very forceful personality by all accounts. 
and she was extremely well connected. She knew lots of the, the sort of the great and the good of Victorian society. So um, you've got Sir John Herschel on the um, on the left here, the astronomer, which is one of my all time favourite portraits. Um, and you can just about see, you know, his his velvet, the piece of velvet cloaking him and the cap, um, kind of make him stand out against the background. And then Virginia Woolf on the right, uh, who she was related to. Um, she made these beautiful portraits, these absolutely fantastic um, portraits. Within 18 months of being given a camera, having never never picked one up before, just as a kind of, oh, this might amuse you. Um, she was treating it as a profession. She was selling selling work. She was, um, she, you know, she was well known. She was very well established because you know, she was very, very forceful, but very, very good. Um, she made a lot of very allegorical work, very Victorian. Again, this kind of high Victoriana where um, everything is... Um, an allegory for something else. Um, that's her husband, Charles Hay Cameron. He was quite a lot older than her. I see her on, in there. Um, because he looked the part, he was often cast as King Arthur or Merlin or um, some somebody King Lear or somebody like that. Um, and he looks fantastic. Unfortunately, um, he he used to get the giggles. He used to um, standing still for a long time, dressed as this, he used to get the giggles and. Uh, um, but there are accounts of him sort of ruining the plates because um, you know, he set everybody else off, whereas everybody else, she she got everybody she could to to help out. You know, it would be the um, the serving girls or the um, you know the people from the village or friends and neighbours. She she drag somebody in, going, "You're going to be Ophelia. You're going to be the angel of whatever." Um, um, but uh, sometimes it was ruined by the fact that uh, he got the giggles. Sorry, Sorry, Peter. Um, we've got another question from yeah. Simon. It says, um, how did early photographers calculate exposure? Uh, suck it and see. <laughs> Guesswork. It's it's one of the problems. It's a good question. One of, one of the problems with, um, with Collodion is because you mix it, or certainly 19th century photographers are almost certainly mixing it themselves, and it changes it as, as it ages, um, you can't use an exposure meter. Um, what you do you do is you experience, you make a plate, you guess your exposure, you look at the plate, and if it's horrendously dark, you make another one that's lighter. If it's horrendously light, you make another one. Um, I make test strip pieces um, to, to kind of adjust for it. Um, you, you, you kind of get to know. Um, Cameron had a big advantage because she was working in um, what she called her glass house, which I think she converted from a, a greenhouse or a... Um, might have been a chicken shed, I think. I can't remember. Um, but you've got a got a fixed thing you're working with. So you say, okay, it's a bit overcast today. Um, you know, daylight today, my exposures are probably going to be a minute. Um, when the sun comes out, they might be 10 seconds. Um, so you'd you'd kind of get to know, but it's uh, it's a tricky thing to do. So this is the the thing about having to have your darkroom with you. Um it's you know, it's if you're Cameron and you're 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 working in a in your own studio with your darkroom kind of next door or in the house, which is how I work a lot of the time, um, it's fine. But if you are if you want to go out into the world on, onto locations and be what we would now regard as a documentary photographer, you've got to take everything with you because you've got to be within a few minutes of, of your um, your processing chemicals to prepare and then to develop. Everything has to be done, process beforehand, exposure, and then back in and develop within 10 or 15 minutes. So this image could almost be, this is one of the, obviously a contemporary illustration, this could almost be um, John Thompson at work. Um, you know, there are accounts of him working very similarly to this, having the, the portable tent darkroom um, with the little lad assistant, and there he is photographing you know, the, the, the landscape. Um, everything in that picture is accurate. I, I could vouch for, you know, I, you, could, you could build that and I could say, right, that's what that is. That's the window in the, in the tent that will be, have red glass in it so that you can, Use it as a safe light. All the funnels for straining the the, um, the bits out of the silver nitrate in the developer, the the fixing tray, and so on, the washing tray, and so on and so forth. It's absolutely accurate. It's how it would have been done. A um, couple of other people um, who, who are also working docu in documentary style. It's you know a lot of people that are, are claimed to be the first documentary photographer. Um, it's very difficult to say who was the first because people were working simultaneously um, in different parts of the world. Um, but somebody who certainly does predate um, John Thompson by uh, quite a few years um, is Matthew Brady, um, American photographer. Um, he's what we would now call an early adopter. He was he was as soon as the daguerreotype news of the daguerreotype reached America, he was one of the first people making um, portraits. But he was a commercial photographer. 
when the American Civil War broke out early 1860s, um, by that time he was very well established and he he put together a team of about 20 photographers, um, usually attributed to the Brady studio, so it wasn't all him, but everything got his name on it, um, to go and photograph the American Civil War act as it was actually happening. Um, and there are actually pictures of battles in progress, but obviously you don't really want to be standing around in a battlefield with an enormous plate camera and a tripod. Um, it's not really a healthy thing to do with the bullets whizzing about. So um, a lot of the time they photographed the aftermath of battles um, and they didn't muck about. They didn't they didn't shrink from showing what it was like. This is this image on the left is quite a mild one by a lot of Brady standards. Um, you can see the dead horses and the, the smashed um, equipment, you know, that's been hit, probably hit directly hit by a cannon shell. They showed dead human beings as well. They they um, they really showed it as it was. Um, and some stupendous portraits. Um, this is um, trying to remember who that is on the, on the right. I can't on the top of my head now. I will in a moment. But um, portraits of the um, of the soldiers, you know, in camp, and you know, quite often the same soldiers dead a week later. Um, extraordinary, extraordinary pictures. Um, nowadays, you know, very highly regarded because of that. At the time, of course. He, he didn't make any money from it. He, he thought he was going to make his fortune, but of course nobody really wanted to to be reminded of the death and destruction after the war. It was uh, um, you know, it was all too painful. It's you know, some things never change, but uh, as a document of of a, of a time, they are extraordinarily high quality work. Um, the English equivalent, if you like, um, was Roger Fenton. Um, and he was working in in the eighteen fifties. Um, he he worked with um, you, know, you can see his photographic van. It says so on the side, uh, very similar to that one I showed earlier. That's his portable darkroom um, and probably living accommodation as well, horse-drawn photographic wagon that he would take to as close to the battlefield, as close to where um, he was working as he possibly could. Um, that's that's not him. That's his assistant sitting on the uh, on the front of it. Um, again, photographing the, the troops, photographing the um, the uh, the battles battlefields and the aftermath of the battle and documenting it but having to have the um the equipment and the the materials right there is a very very difficult undertaking it's not like um you know you can't be like robert capper or somebody running around with a um handheld 35 mil camera shooting away and then get it processed later you had to make a plate go and process it you might make one or two at the same time and have somebody running backwards and forwards to the the van photographing them but um you know, so you get a different kind of approach you get these formal portrait groups much more and you get these landscape things different view of a battle and different view of a um, it doesn't have to be all action you can show more in um, in this kind of way um john thompson I, i'm not going to talk about too much because you've got a whole exhibition to explore so um just uh, a couple of things but um but he was you know he was using this process um right from right from the start um, of his career because it was well underway by the time he started working in the 1860s um, the thing I find most interesting about Thompson, I mean, he's he's a stupendously good photographer. He's, you know, the, the work is is wonderful. It's amazing. Technically, um, from a purely kind of nerdy position um, point of view, images like this are extraordinary. That's an extremely difficult piece of lighting. You know, asking about how lighting, how, how you judge your light, your exposure, um, that's that's tough. Um, what he's done there, he 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 was he did teach other photographers. He was the royal. Um, Geographical Society's photographic instructor. Um, and there are quite entertaining stories of him um, moaning about other photographers, um, uh, people going on expeditions and thinking they could pick it up in, in an afternoon before they set off uh, wherever they were going on it, on, um, on their missions and uh, grumbling about it takes a bit longer to learn than that. What I find most interesting about him though is that he was so interested in people um, and that he would take as long and much time and effort photographing a beggar on a on the street somewhere as he would photographing a king or a um, you know a, a politician or somebody important um, supposedly important. Um, this this series of images um, this is why I've, I've chosen this one as the title picture and it's one of my favourites. Um, he made when he returned to England in the eighteen seventies, and it's um, it's called it's about an itinerant photographer on Clapham Common, and. He he made this series of this this work for a socialist journalist um, called Adolfo Smith, and showed the pictures of the lives of the poor in in England in the eighteen seventies, and the with the accompanying text that goes with this image it says, 
Many of these photographers have been tradesmen or own studios in town, but after misfortunes in business or reckless dissipations are reduced to their present more, more humble avocation. Um, so he recognised a brother photographer here and you know, he would have, he couldn't have done this inconspicuously. He would have had to be very obvious of what he was doing. So they would definitely have had a conversation. I'd love to know what they talked about, what this chap's story was. Had he been, you know, a more high powered studio photographer reduced in reduced circumstances. So he's got this little push cart. That's his, his dark room on wheels. Um, again, with his wares on the side, you know, it's, he's not, it hasn't even got a horse. He's, he's just pushing this along the street. So it's, it's pretty tough. Um, and Thompson recognised that and and sympathised, and uh, he didn't fall into that Victorian trap that um, sometimes um, they did, which is what's sometimes called class tourism, where um, photographers uh, and and other people kind of would, would see the poor as some sort of almost like wildlife to be to be observed. Um, he cared, and you know he he made very very sympathetic, very beautiful work. Um, so in the UK as well as the the wonderful stuff that he's made in the Far East. Um, so that's that's sort of just a handful of people who who worked at the time. So uh, probably another question is going to be, well, what happened to collodion? Um, what happened to the wet plate? Well, the answer is the dry plate. Um, this is this is what came along about twenty years after um, Scott Archer first announced the, the wet plate process. The dry plate was perfected. You can, I love this this um, ad, advert for um, the dry plates. Um, photography past and photography present. So the photography past, the wet plate photographer, there he is with his heavy camera, he's weighed down, he's literally bent over with his tripod and his camera. He's going to have people carrying the tent and all the chemicals and everything. Whereas the dapper chap on the right, um, there he is with his little, little handheld camera and his lightweight tripod and he's off and he's ready for anything. Um, they had the advantage. You didn't have to have a dark room. You could, you could have your plates, you know, all the boxes being, being sent around the world. You could have your plates delivered to you by mail order, they were ready to go. You just used them and then you processed them at your leisure, much like you know modern film is done. So obviously that's every every development in photography has been for one for convenience. Um, so it was much more convenient. It had pretty much no downsides, um, arguably, but um, you know it's it was nice and easy. Um, and so it, it it took over and that that kind of did for for photography. Um, okay, just very, very briefly, because I know I'm going to overrun if I'm not carefully, I'm not careful. But um, Peter, um, sorry, someone just asked, um, when was that? Um, I assume maybe they meant the when does the dry plate dry plate um, comes in, comes in, 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 in. about um, early 1870s, 1871, 1872, something like that. Um, that was that was first kind of produced on a commercial basis, um, and of course it, it almost killed killed off Collodion overnight because what why would you carry on? Um, when you've got something a lot more convenient, you know, it's a bit like digital and film. But um, um, can I well, ask, um, is it? Do you think the did the dry plate plate actually change the quality or the look of the photography? It did change or was the look the... a little bit. Um, okay. Yeah, the the sensitivity is different. They are they were faster, so you could have shorter exposure still, which is obviously a good thing. Um, the one of the things that's interesting about collodion is it's sensitive to a different part of the spectrum. Um, from a lot of other things it's sensitive it's not sensitive to the red end of things at all so people's skin tones sometimes look a bit strange or um but it's also it's very sensitive to the blue end and right into the ultraviolet so the ultraviolet end of the spectrum that we can't see collodion can so you get some interesting skin tones and, and other relationships um i always say when we do portraits everyone looks cool in a wet plate portrait mm -hmm. um, it does something for for skin tones which looks amazing um sometimes people um if, if poorer people um it's one of the reasons we think poor people look dirty um we think oh well they you know they didn't wash um of course they washed but um anybody who's working outside all the time will have a re very ruddy complexion certainly if, if they're um you know if they're a white person um they will naturally be sunburned that renders on collodion as much darker so um poorer people people agricultural laborers or anybody who spends all their time outside has got quite a red face um looks quite dark in a in a in a plate um it did live on collodion did live on as a um for a while longer because of the immediacy of it because the fact you could make an image that you could give to somebody within 15 minutes or so um in seaside photography so there's a lot of seaside pictures 
Um, the ones ones here, um, you know, they're variously. The one in the middle is about 1880, I think. I love it because they all look so miserable. Um, <laughs> um, I don't think it was. It could have been a very nice day, but they're they're glorious. Um, but they may be a bit frightened of the camera. That's about 1880. Um, the three ladies at the top left are about 1900, so long after the dry plate had come along. Um, but then the one on the right is 1930s. So we're still people in the 1930s or even later in some parts of the world making wet plate images on the beach because you could make something almost instantly. You could come along and approach somebody where they're sitting on the beach saying, take your photograph, madam. Um, you know, it'll cost you a shilling or whatever it would be. Um, scuttle back to your, your little tent on the beach and there's some, some brilliant thing. I'd love to do this, actually. <laughs> um, be an interesting exercise. Um, photograph people and then bring the plate back to them all washed and, and dried and stuck to a piece of cardboard and, and make, make work that way. So it lived on in that that sense, but um, eventually even that kind of faded away with the advent of things like Polaroid and people getting their own own cameras and much more cameras when film became a lot cheaper. Roll film changed everything, of course, as well, uh, but that's quite a lot later. Um, so it kind of lay dormant for a very long time. Um, a, a few scientific applications, it never quite died out. There are a few people doing it. Kodak used to do a manual that... Um, stayed in print almost until, certainly into the 1960s and 70s. But hardly anybody was doing it until a few people got interested again. Um, this gentleman on the left, John Coffer, check him out, he's an absolute hero. He's an absolute star. Um, that looks like a picture from the, the mid 19th century. It's not, it's, it's from about 2010, I think. Um, he lives the life. He, he started as an advertising photographer. He got interested in this in the 1970s and started making work, got himself a horse-drawn wagon, made work um, traveling around America in the um, in the 19, late 1970s, early 1980s, and never went back to the, to, um, the 20th century. Um, still lives on a farm in upstate New York with almost no electricity. I think he's got one, one tiny light bulb and a solar generator. Um, and he lives, he lives on a farm with, with chickens and horses and things. And he makes wet plate images in his barn and he's absolute genius at it. He's one of the best wet plate photographers because he's been doing it so long. Um, even though his facilities, he hasn't got a super duper, you know, hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of darkroom. He's doing it with almost nothing. He does annual workshops um, in upstate New York um, and he's an absolute star. The other people of stars are Frank Scully and Mark Osterman. That's their studio in, in Rochester in New York near the Kodak factory. Um, they are pioneers of, of early photography, um, of, of making images that um, with all sorts of historic processes, reviving them, researching them, making them happen again, um, writing sort of the literature. Um, most of us who work with wet plate can trace our kind of teaching lineage back to um, Scully and Osterman in some way. I, I wasn't taught the process by them. I, I nearly got um, taught it by Frank Scully. She had to come cancel at the last minute. So I was taught by one of her pupils but um you know they are the kind of the royalty of um of wet plate um there are lots and lots of people using it these days it's um there's a backlash against digital um uh that we're having in the last few years that people are getting a bit, bit fed up with a kind of over perfection of digital want something more kind of organic feeling and haptic um sally mann's been working for years she was taught by scully and osterman um her work's amazing i think she's a stupendous artist um, Borat Peterlin, um, again, his, his YouTube channel is, is wonderful. Um, he's very funny. He's, he's a kind of um, Slovenian hippie um, kind of wild man um, photographer, um, but he's a terrific photographer, very, very talented, um, very funny, very, um, very kind of generous with his information. And you, if you look, look for him on YouTube, um, you know, and watch some of his videos, they're extraordinary. They're, they're really good fun. Um, and then just lastly, a couple of, couple of things. Um, Joni Sternbach, she's made um, this series on surfers on wet plate, 10, eight plates, quite big plates, um, contemporary surfers in the, you know, the last few years. She's been making for about 10 years, I think. And you can see, you know, it's a contemporary image. You can see that that's not a, you know, not a 19th century person, a 19th century surfboard, um, but how how cool it looks, how wonderful it looks. And um, Ian Ruta on the, on the right, you know, you can make very, very fast exposures, you know, action shots like this. People say, how do you do that with wet collodion, which is something like, if you could measure it, is something like ISO one, it's extremely slow. How do you get pictures of skaters in midair? 
um, the answer is an absolute ton of flash power. Um, it uses kind of industrial quantities of strobe lighting um, to make it work. Um, so those are those people. And then lastly, um, yours truly, um, some of the pictures that I've made or students have made in, in my workshops. Um, you know, I, I, the last workshop I did was at West Dean College. Um, I've got another one scheduled for next year. Um, and of course, we've got the uh, the one coming up at the Russell Coates Museum. Um, that's that's where we are with that, I think. And that's, um, you know, you can find find more details about me on my website. Um, that's kind of where we are. So sorry if I've gabbled a bit, but I'm, I'm trying to get a lot of information in there. But um, that's... No, that's great, Peter. So that's I'll been... come back to the other screen now. Um, there, how's that? Yeah, no, that's fantastic. Um, a few comments just Thank coming you, in saying... Yeah, beautiful, Peter. Absolutely fantastic. So, um, right. yeah, no, questions? just on the, on the subject of the wet collodion workshop, I just wanted to say to everyone that yeah, we uh, Peter's doing a workshop at the Russell Coates in a few weeks, but unfortunately it has sold out already. Um, but we are looking to organise some new dates for the for next year. Um, so if you are interested, um, please do drop us an email. Um, and we can add you to the wait list because I think it's a real it's a really unique opportunity to actually have a go. Um, and I think if you're coming to see the exhibition at the Russell Coates as well, it's just that kind of extra, extra layer, layer of insight. You kind of know that he was walking around the jungle with all of this equipment and um, yes. just amazing, you know, amazing photographs, amazing portraits. Um, and yeah, so uh, let us know if you if you would like to join the yeah. waiting list for that. Um, oh, we've got a few questions. There we go. Um, I read somewhere that the. Oh, I'm not sure. Can you can you see the messages, Peter? Uh, I can only see the first line. Hang on, let me see if I can get it. Um, no, I, I don't know how to, I don't know how to see the whole message. Um. um if you pop onto the bottom of your screen where it says chat, you should be able to open it up. I can't. Oh, there's it's... chat. There's chat. Got it. Got it. All right. I read somewhere that the advent of panchromatic photography was seen as not true photography by some. Um, did this kind of reaction happen as these older processes have moved on? Yes, absolutely. Um, every, every process that comes along, the people who've put all the time and effort into the previous process um immediately um poo poo it um you know i was the same when digital came along um <laughs> when when you've invested a lot of your time and, and effort into um into something and then another process comes along and it looks different um of course the the natural reaction is to say um okay um this is this is this is not right this is not true photography um, so if, if if people are baffled by what we mean by panchromatic photography, panchromatic photography is um, it's sensitive to all the colours. So you get a, a truer rendition in black. It's always black and white. But in, in, in black and white, then a light red will look like a light grey. A dark red will look like a dark grey. Whereas with collodion and things that aren't sensitive to, to red um, end of the spectrum at all, reds and sometimes even yellows will come out as nearly black. Um, and blues look um, lighter than they would naturally. Um, sometimes you can tell it if you see a picture and it's um, it's got um, Union Jacks in it. Um, there was a good, an ideal thing because if the Union Jack looks a bit odd and it looks like it's missing some sections and some parts look, you know, the, the red parts look too dark, it's on ortho film. It's um, or um, even wet plate um, because it's it's not sensitive to the the red and it's oversensitive to the blue. So um, yeah. All, all sorts of things happened like this. Um, somebody who's very good on this subject is um, Arthur Conan Doyle. Um, he, he wrote about, he was a keen photographer and he he wrote about his experiences as a, as a kind of amateur photographer. Um, and it's, it's very entertaining reading it from that, that length of time ago. All his views on, on camera clubs and photographic societies and people's views on what was photography and what wasn't, nothing changes, <laughs> it's all the same. Great. Okay. Any, any, anything else? Any more there? questions? Um, some various people saying um, join join the waiting list. Um, yeah, I've just I've just popped in the chat. So if you email the Russell Coates email address, 
um, then we'll we'll put the waiting list together. And I'm just going to drop in the um, the link to the John Thompson exhibition as well, um, which has opened um, really recently. We had our private view last week, mm -hmm. and um, it's on until April. Um, so lots of time to come and drop by and see it at the Russell Coates. I mean, I oh, someone's just put. I'm wondering how. I am really real interested about... in the history of spirit photography. Ah. I'm wondering how people were fooled with so much knowledge of photography around. I'm getting around. Um, it, that's an interesting one. I think I think they wanted to believe. Um, there's something very interesting with with the whole nature of, of the kind of spiritualism or the spirit spirit. The Victorians are very interested in it, um, and it's you can kind of ally the technology of the day to um, what was was um, was most kind of prevalent. So when the telegraph was invented, um, there was lots of of communicating with spirits with table tapping, um, with the idea of sort of going, well, it's like a telegraph. Um, and then spirit photography, um, making spirit photographs is with wet plate, with the long exposure, is great fun. It's very easy to do. Um, it's, um, you know, when you've got a long exposure, you can just take a piece of, of muslin or silver foil or something and kind of wave it about or do a double exposure, which is a lot of um, how it was done. There was, a, there was a chap called William Mumler, who was a, um, the Victorian spirit photographer. And yeah, they look corny to us now you know there's somebody's portrait and then in, behind somebody's head there's another figure sort of go um being a <laughs> um they look they look really corny but um yeah i think people wanted to to believe it more than anything else so um yeah it's it, you can make some quite i mean the, the the double exposure thing and making something an image that was transparent um people didn't understand how photography worked um, in the way that we don't, none of us really understand how digital photography works. You know, we we, we can say, oh, well, it's all ones and zeros. It's all magic pixies that um, that work away inside the computer and make it happen. Um, we, it's, <laughs> you know, it's it's very hard to distinguish it from magic. But um, that's, uh, yeah, I, we, we we like to be conned. We like to believe things. I think, but um, yeah. So if, if you are coming to the um, on on the workshop and you want to make a spirit photograph um we we'll, we'll, we can make it happen we can we can make some ectoplasm and uh, <laughs> do that kind of thing or double dummy image double images that sort of thing i would love that yeah okay <laughs> <laughs> is the uh, other thing that they can also bring someone else if they wanted to do a portrait of someone or yep. like a friend or I'm, family I'm member or a, uh, there's only... you do a couple portrait or is it yes, more just absolutely yeah yes. couple portrait as well so yeah there's there's only four of four places on the um, workshop because that's we've got to keep the numbers quite small because it does take quite a long time to make make plates and I want to make sure everybody gets gets to make something and you will get to keep whatever whatever you make of course so um you know, there's got to be time to to, to wash them and, and uh, preserve them and all the rest of it but um no so long if the museum are happy to you know let let other halves or subjects in as well and be part of it I'm I'm very happy with that yeah, definitely. I yeah. think um, it's been really popular already. So I think, yeah, the more the more workshops we can do, the better, really. Hope so. Yeah. What type uh, oh, of paper was used? What kind of paper was used? Um, rag or wood pulp? Good question. I um, it's it's very hard to say. Um, one of the mysteries of of Talbot's process in particular was. Um, trying to find which papers worked best. And it's still something that we work with. You know, I make, um, I do other processes like cyanotype or argyrotype or calotype and, the, and um, some papers work brilliantly and some papers are a disaster. Um, and it's never as simple as is either rag or wood pulp. It's, it tends to be the acid content in the paper and some super duper, super expensive, um, fantastic um, quality drawing papers, cartridge papers can be either terrible or wonderful and sometimes the cheap ones can be better um it's it's very hard to say you know Talbot's favorite paper was something called Watman's Turkey Mill a writing paper which is probably what he just had um to hand you know in his desk and we still don't really know what the formulation of Watman's Turkey Mill paper was um because you know trying to replicate his his images is quite difficult so um 
Uh, generally speaking, I use when I'm, I'm making prints from things I use um, there's an arch paper, a French paper called arch, or brown, uh, pronounced arch. I think arches. Um, that's that's quite quite good. Platina type paper, um, that sort of thing. But um, yeah, it's about the one. I have a look at that, I think. Um, will this talk be available to other people for a while? Yes, yes, it's been recorded and. Um, yeah, we're going to pop it onto our YouTube channel um, on Russell Coates, so it will be available for the duration of the exhibition. Brilliant. I think um, I think if there's no more questions, I think we'll say goodbye. Okay. You're happy, Peter? Yeah, yeah. well, thank you all yeah. for coming, or <laughs> whatever the equivalent <laughs> of coming is on Zoom, but um, thank you for your, for your time. Um, but, oh, you got some claps. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> That's very kind of you. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm looking forward to see seeing the uh, ones of you who are on the um, going to be on the um, on the workshop. And, uh, for everybody else, so enjoy the exhibition. Um, Russell Coates is a fantastic place. I love it. So, uh, thank you all very much. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. And um, yeah, do you drop an email to be put on the waiting list? Uh, we can sort that out for you. Um, but yeah, we'll see you next time. Great.